15th, which uh, is someday in the future, uh, next Tuesday. And then uh, checkpoint two is due on the 22nd. Uh, so please make sure you don't miss those deadlines. Uh, remember, it is not graded aside from completeness, right? So it's just kind of yes, no, did you submit it? Remember to submit it as a group, um, you know, assuming you're working with a group, uh, make sure you get everybody on there so we don't have 57 submissions of the same thing, uh, which is super annoying for the graders. Uh, and I think that's about it. Any questions? So, so the midterm, so we're doing the midterm redo. Uh, it's, it's as if it was taking place at the normal midterm time. So no, nothing additional will be there. Uh, it probably will be a Jupyter notebook as usual. So make sure you prep one beforehand. Um, so basically all the kind of same rules apply. Um, and, oh, actually that was one of the things I meant to do last night and I forgot. I'm gonna put uh, like a Google form on there. So please sign up if you're gonna take it just so I make sure I have enough room. Uh, for the number of people who are going to show up, I it, I haven't put it up yet. I like I'll I'll do a reply to the Piazza note. So just keep an eye out for it. Um, and you know if you want to take it, um, if you have any kind of general concerns about whether you should take it or not, uh, please see me maybe just after lecture today or come by my office hours on whatever I next have office hours Monday. What day is today? Thursday? Yeah. So Monday. Um, and uh, talk to me about it then. Uh, you know, some people I'm sure will be on the fence about whether they want to do it or not. Uh, and so, yeah. All right, any other questions? Okay, As, if you can't tell the announcements page is the thing I do at the very last minute and sometimes run out of time. So uh, that's why it's often not updated. All right, so we've had, I know a bunch of questions to office hours about p-values. So I thought I'd kind of go through another explanation of it, just, oh boy, to hopefully uh, help clarify it some more. Um, and maybe it'll help some of you uh, or uh, basically reaffirm what you already know. So to start off with, okay, this is the definition of what the p-value is, okay? So when the p-value is the chance that the null hypothesis is, that if the null hypothesis is true, that the test statistic is equal to the value that was observed in the data or is even further in the direction of the alternative. So in other words, you set up an, a test, right? So you are, that's what those loops are when we're doing, you know, 20,000 tests. So what we're doing is we're showing what does the null hypothesis kind of space, where can those tests land, okay? And if we can define what that space is, and then we look at our observed value and it's in that space, well, it seems reasonable that the null hypothesis is true. Right? Because we know the observed example is true, right? Because it was observed. However, as is often the case, it's actually on one of the edges of the null space. Okay. And so therefore, depending on how close it is to the edge or even beyond the edge, that means that it that the alternative is true. And so what we say is there's this window on the edges, okay, that is that P cutoff. And if the p-value lands in one of those windows, then we're, we're arguing that the alternative is true because it's close enough to the edge that it may as well be in the alternative. That makes sense? So we have some more examples. All right, so this was another explanation I found. Uh, this one sadly was not from Spotify, not Spotify. Uh, uh, no, I can't think of the name of it. Shopify, yes. Um, I was like, Spotify? No, that doesn't sound right. Uh, so the p-value tells you how often you would expect to see a test statistic as extreme or more extreme than the one calculated by your statistical test. If the null hypothesis of the test was true, the p-value gets smaller as the test statistic calculated from your data gets further away from the range of the test statistics. So in other words, as you get closer into those margins, your p-value gets smaller, making the alternative hypothesis more likely to be the true case. Okay. And remember, a lot of the time, what we're setting up or our expectation, like, you know, going in, what we're kind of expecting to have happen is that the alternative will be true, but we can't test the alternative. So we test the null so that we can prove that it's not in the null, so it must be in the alternative. Okay. And for some reason, they did not change slides. Okay. 
So what we're doing to get to the p-value, right, is we first set up our experiment. So first what we do is determine our null hypothesis. Okay, so what is it we're setting out to test, okay? So not necessarily what we're setting out to prove per se, but what are we gonna go test, okay? So it's something we can test through simulation, okay? So this is where like some things, you know, I keep using that spam uh, example from the homework because I think it's a good one. Um, we can't set up a test for targeting, but we can set up a test for not targeting or random, right? And it often makes use of, use of randomness, determine our alternative hypothesis. So, and this is really important, right? What we're doing is we're trying to say, okay, because of because it's not in this space, it must be in this other space. The only way we can do that is if we have two sides of the same coin, right? So in other words, or like the complement we were talking about, right? Is that, you know, earlier on we were saying, sometimes it's easier actually to prove the complement than it is to prove the initial thing. This is the same idea, okay? But they have to be exactly opposite from each other. Because if there's any wiggle room between the two hypotheses, right? Then your the true state could be in that wiggle room, right? Or at least argued that it could be. All right, and so then we determine the P cutoff. So basically, how much do we consider there to be overlap between the space of the null hypothesis and the space of the alternative hypothesis? Because there's probably some overlap, right? Because of randomness and how perfect our random testing can be. So we're gonna say, you know what? If it's on the edges, if it's within 5% of one of those edges, we're just gonna call that part of the alternative, okay? We could argue, right, that it's just as easily could be argued that it's part of the null. But in our case, we're going to set it up and say our random space, we know we can test this space. However, there's there's wiggly stuff on the edges. So we're going to consider that part of the alternative. If we're really confident, then we go to, say, 1%. But if we're not quite as confident, we're, we go to 5%. And it's basically considered not, like, legit if you go over 5%. So, you know, you could say the gap is this big, right? But no one who's going to look at your data is going to believe you, okay? And believe that the alternative is true if it fell within, you know, 27% on either end, right? Because if it's too, it's too far into the null space. So therefore, it's got to be on, you know, that it seems like that's still null is true. All right, so now we have ugly pictures because I made these and I made them yesterday. So they're ugly. Um, but so imagine, you know, kind of a number line and our testing is going to be kind of somewhere between N and N plus five. Okay. And the reason I just kind of said N is because I just want to imply there's no fixed place where this is. It may not even be numbers. It's just an example. Okay. So this is what I was trying to kind of write on the chalkboard the other day. When we run our experiment, the only things we can do is run things that land in this space or in theory. Okay. So if we have things that land in this space when we do our, our simulation, our simulation isn't a good one, right? So in other words, or kind of taking the other way around, you don't draw this first. You draw this after you run your simulation and you find out, oh, hey, you know, the null looks to be at between n plus one and n plus four, okay? However, see, yeah, so however, when we run that, okay, and let's say this was the results of our simulation, our observed stat is here, okay, which is technically still in that null hypothesis space. But because we set a P cutoff of, and I'm just going to tell you that this is 0.5, okay, whether it looks like it or not, that we're saying, in fact, we're considering 0.5 to actually be part of this circle over here. And we're considering 0.5 to actually be part of that part. Okay, so if it's in there, sorry, not 0.5, 5%, my bad. Um, so so 0 0.05. So basically it's like anything that's kind of right here on the border, we're considering part of over here. Does that make more sense? Okay, yeah. So it's like 5% on the other side of the other. Yeah, in fact, what I should have done was actually just draw on this slightly differently, like move the little alternative bubble here so that it's like just shading into the null hypothesis space. And you can see if there's an overlap, right? But we as the experiment setter uppers, okay, are gonna just declare at the outset that if it, the P cutoff, okay, 
if the P is in that space, then it's part of the alternative. Okay. So we're, you know, this is kind of like by convention. It is not necessarily true. Okay. We're just declaring it as part of our experiment that this is the case. So if somebody really doubts it somewhere in the future, they could come back and redo it and decide, you know what, you know, 5% uh, is not an appropriate amount. It has to be within 1% because I can prove for whatever reason that something that's at 4.8, okay, is part of the null. Does that make sense? Like it's just, I'm just saying it's true. Okay, do you have a question? So if it's at 2 and 5%, and something that's at 5%, then it's very hard to get alternative. Yeah, so, well, the 5% is the cutoff. So the actual p value is 4.9. And then we consider it part of the alternative. Right, exactly. So, but, but to be clear, it could be wrong. It's just that we've set up the experiment in advance and kind of like you do with good experiments, you kind of set up the rules for the experiment before you run the experiment. And then when you set up the rules for the experiment before you run it, then the results are more likely to be consistent with whatever you're measuring, right? So at the outset, we just said, you know what? If it's within 5% of the edge of the null space, we're going to call that alternative. So, you know, if it was four, if it was 2.2, right? But if it was six, nope, our whole, our whole experiment was false, okay? Those observed spam calls were in fact possibly random. Okay. All right. And so finally, kind of to basically, it's kind of what I was just saying, but we come to a conclusion. Is it less than our P cutoff? Then the alternative hypothesis is true. If it's more, then the null hypothesis is true. And you will find cases where your expectation is that the null hypothesis is true. Like that the, you know, that the inbound spam calls you recorded were in fact random that and that's what you're trying to prove maybe you're the phone company right and so you shouldn't have to take fault for these spammers targeting you okay and so you want to prove that it's actually random right so so kind of your expectation going in doesn't necessarily change the experiment it's just kind of what you expect from the outcome do you expect it to be null or do you expect it to be alternative but because we've set up the rules in advance our bias can't influence the result Okay, so it's fine to have a bias as long as you're controlling for it in the experiment. Okay, so, and finally, kind of, you know, why does this happen, right? So we now know that the chance of which bucket, so the null or the alternative hypothesis, the experiment will land in. So in other words, if I go and run that simulation again, all right, there is a 95% chance that it will fall in the alt in the uh, null space, okay, because the peak cutoff problem, all right. Uh, and in fact, if you think about it slightly differently, sometimes it makes a little more sense. And I don't know if I have a slide in here, but later, if you say a five percent cutoff, right, it's actually two and a half percent on each end, right, because it's a total of five percent. You know, I keep drawing it and showing it to you as like as if it was five percent on either end that actually would be 10%, right? Because it's five plus five. So it's actually two and a half on either side. Does that make sense? Zero point two five. No, uh, sorry, 0 0.025 on each side, right? Because, oops, because there's actually two of them, right? There's, there's this little slice here, you know, ignore my number line. In this little slice here, the total of those slices has to add to 5% or 1%. So it could be, uh, I don't know how many zeros, 0 0.005 on one side, right? And 0 0.005 on the other. All right. And then lastly, so in other words, what we're really trying to show, right, is that if I go and run the experiment again, however, it doesn't have to be a simulated experiment now. Now we can go record our next 50 spam calls, okay? And if they're random, then they will fall in the null hypothesis space. And if they're not random, they will fall in the alternative space. 
So in other words, if I record another 50 spam calls, what you prove in that homework, and who knows how much I'm giving away about the homework, but what you're proving in that homework, right, is that if I get another 50 spam calls later on, okay, and two of them are from 617, it's targeted because that means it's in the alternative. That makes sense? But if I only get zero, or if I get zero or I get one, we're saying that that's not targeted. That really is random, okay? And if I get 36 spam calls out of 50, which space is that in? Anybody? Right, and which which is which hypothesis? Right, yeah. Sorry, it's hard to hear you down here, but the, my computer is also very angry with me, et cetera. Um, all right, so um, it's just kind of just another graphic, kind of showing the same thing, right? Um, it's actually uh, I don't know if it's the same graphic before, um, but this isn't it's like you know not really to scale, right? You would expect our observed dot to be like way over here. Right, but it's kind of the idea is that okay, so now this is our null, right? And then this is our alternative over here. Okay. I don't know. This this picture is less valuable, I think. However, um, just kind of from a ter terminology perspective, I actually talked about this, I don't know, like three or four lectures ago. We were talking about like, you know, if your observed stat is in the tail, so the thing that looks like a tail as it goes out here then it's likely in the alternative hypothesis space, right? Um, and if the P value or the P cutoff is 5%, we consider that statistically significant, or that's the, that's the slang official term for when it's 5%, but if it's at 1%, so in other words, 0 0.005 on either end, that would be highly statistically significant. So in other words, we're really confident that if you go and do the experiment again, simulated or in the real world, you will get a result that, you know, if it's random, then it will be, or it'll, if it's the null, it'll be in the null space or it'll be in the alternative space if it's an alternative. So in other words, we can predict which bucket it will be in, right? All right. So, and then what this is trying to show, right, is kind of laying out all of your experiments and where the blue line doesn't cross, those should add up to be less than, let's say, 5% of your total experiments, okay? And it's really, what I find the most confusing about this is that, you know, each of these lines is an experiment, okay? And that experiment might be, you know, 50 spam calls, it might be, you know, 2,000 something else, you know, whatever, and that this, then all of the experiments is the loop, right? Is the number of times you run it. All right. Um, so kind of moving on to confidence intervals again. Um, any questions so far? Does that make more sense? All right. Does everyone, you know, grow up to have a p-value? Yeah. How can you calculate? The p-value, it depends on the situation. So I think we have an example in the notebook, um, but basically it's a division. Uh, sorry. Um, so a 95% confidence interval. So this is kind of what we were talking about before. Um, I like talking about it in terms of this slide better. Um, but basically, so we have 95% confidence, but the confidence interval is because we're just saying that this is kind of in the middle there-ish, okay? But remember my Funko measurement, right? I, for whatever, based on whatever experiment I did, the best I can do for a ruler is one that, you know, has a marker at 90.3 and one at 95, 7.6, and doesn't have one at 95, okay? So, so I can say that it's in this range and we think it's this, okay? But again, all you're saying here is that this efficacy, so in other words, the, you know, the vaccine, whichever one it is, the Pfizer vaccine, is 95% effective in this window of experiments. 
Okay, so that doesn't mean that you couldn't pull an experiment somehow where it was 80%. It just means it's really statistically unlikely, like really, really, really unlikely. Okay, and that's why these numbers are so high, right? Because it's a very small space where you could fall into the wrong bucket. Okay, so, and usually this is 95% or better, but if you think about it, 97% is just as statistically unlikely as 90%, right? But often when you're doing an experiment like this, they're actually just kind of rounding to 95. So they might've gotten a bunch that were 95, 96, 97. It's usually considered, or not rounding, kind of taking the floor because it's usually considered disingenuous to take like the average of your results. You usually take the floor. So kind of the worst case, okay? However, if you think about it mathematically, let's say every single one came out to be 95% when we were in this level of confidence, so not in the outliers, then 97% effectiveness and 87% you know, effectiveness are equally unlikely, right? Okay, so here we go. We have a question for the audience. Um, and basically, so by our calculation, an approximate 95% confidence interval for the average age of the mothers in the population is 26.9 to 27.6 years. Is, yeah, so is this statement true or false based on this information? And the idea is read it for a second and then raise your hand with which one you think is true. All right, so I'll count to three and then everybody raise their hands, okay? So raise your right hand or your, uh, if for true and raise your left hand for false. All right, are we ready? Three, two, one, go. All right, keep your hands up. All right, so the answer is false, okay? How many people got it right? All right. So this is what's so particular about these confidence intervals thing. So the answer is false because we're estimating that their average age is in this interval. So we're not saying that 95% of them will be in the interval. We're saying their average age will be in the interval. And it seems, I think, like a subtle difference. But if you think about it, it's actually very, or it is quite different, right? I don't know about very different, but it's definitely different, okay? So, and this is where they get tricky because you really got to think about what is it actually telling you? It's not quite telling you what maybe you think it is. And this is why, um, you know, a lot of this kind of information is when it, you know, kind of comes out to the public, people get really confused because they read that as everyone who takes this vaccine, it will be 95% effective. And that is not what this says. It's in the neighborhood, but that's not what this says, okay? So if this is how you can kind of spread disinformation by saying something like this, right? And then run a controlled experiment and kind of do something or whatever and end up with a 93% effectiveness by maybe your sample was too small, okay? So you did it with five people and oh, hey, look at this. We did this experiment and it was only 92% effective. All of this must be bold. Right, but it's not. It's that they're the you know the typical person doesn't read it correctly, and it's it stinks right for scientists a lot of the time that they really try very very hard to be accurate, right? And so sometimes true accuracy also brings confusion. All right, so here's another one. See how we do on this one. Um, so an approximate 95% confidence interval for the average age of the mothers in the population is 26.9 to 27.6 years. There is a 0.95 probability that the average age of mothers in the population is in the range 26.9 to 27.6. All right, true is right hand, left is uh, false. Three, two, one. All right, 
Uh, I wonder how long it takes till everyone just starts like guessing that it's always a trick question. Um, all right, so this one's false because the average age of the mothers in the population is unknown, but it's a constant. Okay, kind of going back to that slide earlier, it's not random. There's no chance involved. Okay, so and this is kind of a subtlety of the language again, where we kind of are saying, okay, um, it, it, it's some fixed number. It's not a range. Does that make sense? Like, like there is an actual observed value possible if you could observe it, right? So again, this one, I'm also, you know, it's kind of like, I show this one, this is, I think, even more based kind of on language than it is based on, you know, something you really need to understand strongly. But the point is that um, just kind of keep in mind that, uh, remember, I didn't put it in this slide deck. I think it was last time and the time before where I kind of said, you know, when we when we look at this map, right, this thing is a variable, this thing's constant, this, you know, whatever, those, the fact that those are true is important, okay, even though it doesn't necessarily seem like it. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind and we'll maybe talk about it some more at some point. Um, All right, so, and we have a demo. Maybe today's demo will go a little better than last day's demo. All right, so we have uh, to run this. All right, and so, we have a table of babies, okay? So this is the same table we were working with before, which was talking about, um, you know, maternal smoking or not, um, but there's a bunch of other data in here and we're gonna use a little bit more of that in our bootstrapping example. So we talked about bootstrapping in the lecture last time, but we didn't talk about like an example. So this is us talking about a bootstrapping example. So does anybody remember when you should use bootstrapping? Right, so when you don't have a complete data set or you or you don't think it's a complete data set, uh, bootstrapping can be a good way to kind of almost manufacture a, a complete data set, okay? Um, and so we're gonna look at this histogram of maternal age um, because what we wanna do is let's say we're investigating the average age of um, these mothers, okay? so. Uh, this one should be really obvious to all of you. Actually, we're going to talk about this before. I know a number of people have asked me before the difference between mean and average on MP. Um, and we actually have the answer on the slide later. Um, but basically, the answer is one of them allows you to do weights in your averages. So, right. So, like, uh, when we do a grade, for example, exams count for some percentage, right? And homeworks count for another percentage. So, doing a normal average doesn't work. Right, you want to give weights to pieces of the average. So we don't do that in this class, but that's what it's for. All right, so to go get the average age, very easy, straightforward, right? 27 um, or thereabouts. Um, that would be interesting to actually pull how much that's changed over the years. Um, so now what we want to do is we're going to run an experiment, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to do a bootstrapping experiment. So the first thing we need to do is kind of set up a function that's going to measure our um, each of our simulations. Uh, I just realized I had no idea what time it was. Um, and so that's the first thing we need to do. So we need to make that function. And it's just going to do basically exactly the same thing we just did, except in a way that we can call it multiple times a little bit more easily. Um, so, and a little bit more, we're going to actually sample from maternal age, okay? So can anybody tell me what is this gonna do? Kind of the way it's set up there. And so I wanna point out what happens with no parameters. Any ideas? Right. 
right? And what's significant about this sample when I don't pass any parameters? Of what size? Do you know? All right, how about you? It gives you the whole thing. Okay, so if you remember from last time, when you're doing bootstrapping, you have to sample the whole thing. Okay, and then what's the other implied default? Is this with or without replacement? No, with replacement. And that's the key difference for bootstrapping is that we want to do it with replacement. <clears throat> because basically, if you think about it, right, why were we doing it without replacement before? It's because we wanted to maintain the distribution of the existing data set. Okay, so we didn't want to mess with it. We didn't want to say, okay, all of a sudden everyone is making $365,000 because we just managed to get the same row over and over again. When we're bootstrapping, we're not doing that because we're not confident that we have a sample that is representative of the distribution, okay? So in other words, like we have less confidence here. So we're taking some more latitude in our, in our experimentation, okay? All right, so I'm gonna run that. Uh, and then basically it's the same kind of thing we've been doing all the way along. We're going to run a thousand experiments of those samples by calling this method up here. And we're going to just collect all of the averages. Um, I feel bad saying collect all the means. Is that like a group of people like the mean girls or. Um, and in theory. Now, can anybody tell me what I'm basically doing here with the left and the right there? Any theories about why I would do that? Right. So, so basically, I'm imagining I have a five percent cutoff peak out cutoff, right? And so that means I need two and a half on one side and ninety-seven point five on the other side, right? And then they add up to five. Um, and so, basically, really, what I'm doing here, though, I mean, it's just trying to like I'm trying to get a sense of where the space is that these all these averages land. Okay, but I'm kind of throwing out or being aware of where the edges of it are. Okay, and specifically a very like specific block on either end um, so that I know where that is. All right, and so now, um, let me just make sure I'm gonna say this right. Yeah, so it's gonna be a little hard to read, but basically this, is our histogram of our averages, okay? And our yellow line here is that window that we would normally think of as null hypothesis. We haven't actually set up a null hypothesis exactly yet. So, you know, it doesn't have to be, but that's the idea is that this part of the histogram is the part we kind of consider useful, right? Because if it's on the edges, then we know that it could be actually bleeding into in the example I gave before, the alternative hypothesis, right? So, so this area is useful to experiments or information about this thing that we're measuring. Because thing is out here, what we're saying is that anything on the, after this yellow line, we're considering an outlier. In the spam call example, an outlier means targeted. In this, it means it's a it's an age that is an outlier. So we we're not going to say anything interesting about you know I don't know seventy year old women having children, okay? Because they would be you know way out there, right? But to some extent, if we take a group of women, okay, and they average age at twenty seven, then wait, so that's let's say thirty, okay? So over here somewhere, but you know imagine a little closer. Um, then that means that that population that we grabbed for that sample was like too much of an outlier. The whole population, if you go back to that other graphic with the yellow lines, right? Imagine the yellow line is just basically like way over here, right? Or way over there. It's just not useful to our sampling and our simulation or our experiment because it just, it just came out wrong, okay? And we're going to say that can happen about 5% of the time. Okay. And if we do a good job, that's true.
but if we do a bad job, then it's not. Um, all right, so let me try and. All oh, right, okay, so now to kind of further, and I forgot this was in here, otherwise I could have just showed it to you and talked about it. Um, oop, where'd it go? Did I run the wrong cell? Oh, I ran the wrong cell, sorry. So, for example, here it is with those populate with the uh, ages of women and having children, right? These red ones are far, well, these ones might be right on the, the edge, right? You know, so they, but they're just outside of our window, okay? And the blue ones cross our window. So in other words, we're looking at the blue ones and we're gonna kind of ignore the red ones and say they're, they're just anomalous experiments, okay? And what that means we can say is that we have 195% confidence intervals for a mean of zero. So in other words, 95% of the lines are blue, okay? But it doesn't mean, right, that all of the mothers are in a particular age range. It means that the average of each simulation is in an age range, okay? So you could have, you know, whatever. I mean, it's weird because it's it's actually talking about child, uh, you know, having kids. So there is a, an age range which is like required, right? Um, but you know, if if one of our groups had a twenty year old and a you know fifty year old, right, that might skew that average to just way outside of anything else that looks like the real world. Outliers happen, but most of the time when we want to do this kind of science, we need to control for the outlier somehow. And we have to be legit about it. Like we have to say, this is the rule we're declaring and we're gonna ignore outliers that are outside that. And other people are gonna review it and say, nope, that's a bad choice. Or, yep, I agree, that that makes sense of ignoring those outliers because the, the area that you're looking at essentially is big enough that you truly are looking only at out, like outliers are really just being ignored. They're not relevant to the story. Um, if you go back to that time, the time when we were talking about the planes taking off, right? And there was one that was like hours late, okay? For most of the kinds of things you wanna do about trying to figure out, maybe you wanna look at how do we get United Airlines to more regularly leave on time, okay? Well, what you wanna do is be able to have a metric that says, how often are our planes leaving on time? you can probably safely ignore that 5% of super anomalous conditions when you're trying to figure out what that metric is so that you can bring, excuse me, the, your uh, average time of flight departure down. All right, now we go back to the slides and we're gonna talk about averages. Oh, but before that, um, we're gonna talk about when not to use the bootstrap, which I think we've kind of covered a bit, okay? But um, it's it's dangerous to use the bootstrap when you're kind of talking about if, if what you're trying to experiment around is like edges, right? As you can see, we already wanna throw out the edges, okay? But if your experiment is, a, is about edges, it's gonna be tough. And when I say edges, things like min and max, you know, very high or very low percentiles, right? So, you know, if if your experiment is really important to be at the, you know, whatever, let's say like, you know, 92% and, you know, I don't know, let's say 6%, it's gonna be, it's not gonna work very well, okay? It's gonna give you not great results. Um, and if you're trying to estimate any parameter that's greatly affected by rare elements of the population, so, this is why I was actually struggling with the example of like women having children, right? Because we can't say, or we are unlikely to say a 150 year old woman giving birth to a child, okay? But that would be an example of something that is massively gonna affect our, our estimations because we do have a, a structure such that the one thing has a very strong influence on the other. So we can have people who are quite old and quite young Right. Um, and if we do and imagine that they were having children, okay, that might not be the best example for bootstrap. The nice thing about 
you know, uh, mothers having children is that there, it is relatively constrained, okay? Sure, there's some anomalous stuff, but, you know, generally speaking, most people have children between, you know, 20 and 40, right? Um, and that's what I was saying. It'd be interesting to look at that because I think that's shifting upward, um, but, you know, you all get the idea. If the probability distribution of your statistic is not roughly bell-shaped, and many of you, do you, all, do you all know what standard deviation is or a bell-shaped curve? Raise your hand if you know what a bell-shaped curve is. Okay, we're going to talk about what it actually is, and I don't think we're going to get to it today, but probably next time. But so bell-shaped curve, kind of exactly what it sounds like, right? So imagine the picture of a bell, and then does the curve of like your histogram look like a bell, okay? And there's all kinds of neat properties you get because of that symmetry. So just by way of demonstration, right? So you can imagine kind of drawing a line over this histogram and it would look kind of like a bell, all right? Of course, a very stylized bell. Um, and then if the original sample is very small, okay? Um, and this is another one of those things where it's kind of like, well, what does very small mean? It depends on what your experiment is, right? Um, so if it's, it's really small, if you have, you know, 10 samples, or did we talk about the tall, no, we haven't talked about the tall buildings, but let's say we have 10 samples of late plane flights, okay? And we know there's like thousands and thousands and thousands a day, right? That's a very small sample, okay? However, maybe we have 10 or whatever, and our whole data set or our whole census, right, would be in the, uh, like, maybe 500, then maybe it's not too small. So the same number may be too small sometimes, but just right other times, okay? There's no such thing as the sample size being too big, right? Because no matter what, more data is better as long as the data is like good, right? Yeah. So, so that's what we're gonna talk about for, I don't know about the rest of the semester, but lots more lectures about like what to do in the other cases. So yes, sometimes, um, but there's other, there's actually other full-blown techniques you can use for those scenarios. So it's kind of like, you know, I go back to the first or second lecture. It's like, you know, we talk about the carpenter who's got, you know, a whole mess of tools in their garage. You just need to know the tools are all there. And then sometimes you're gonna want that tool versus this tool, depending on the job you need to do. So yes but there's more than just medians. That makes sense? Yeah, different other like approaches rather than bootstrap. Like we've done two so far, which is where we have the census population and then we simulate the same thing, right? Using kind of without replacement. Then we have bootstrap, which we have not as good of a, of a population. Um, and then we have more things that we will cover that are for kind of other scenarios. Right. And so then you can kind of say, okay, I've got, you know, I've got this checkbox and that checkbox and that checkbox, which means I should choose this technique. Right. Um, did anybody take uh, like math? You probably took math. Some people here took it in this country and have done um, whatever the new math is called. Um, what is it? A common core. Did anybody do common core here for math growing up? One of the things that is, fascinatingly awesome about common core is that like kindergarten first grade second grade the way they teach you to do addition and multiplication and stuff like that is they they don't actually tell you how to do it they tell you a bunch of approaches and then you kind of have to discover which way to do it and the reason parents who grew up like my age right uh who grew up with not common core hate it is because they don't understand they don't really understand math and kind of to your point, right? Um, that we need, you know, when we're doing mathematics, statistics, programming, whatever, and actually a lot of other things in life, we kind of have a set of tools and we have to know enough about the tools and the problem to know which tool goes to what problem, right? And Common Core, the math in particular, I don't know much about the rest of Common Core, but Common Core math in particular does a really nice job of the first thing it teaches you is that not all techniques work for all problems. You know, eventually you learn kind of the more structured way that was the way like I was taught math. But 
I think it's a really important, useful, really cool thing about it, which you know applies to this exact problem here is I'm giving you a set of tools and a way to identify a problem that matches that tool, but it's you have to eventually learn, hey, I have technique A and I have problem B. I need to figure out, you know, does technique A work with problem B or do I need technique K, right? And it gets even more crazy when you start getting to like machine learning and stuff like that, because then you have really small problem areas where things work really, really well. Um, and every, you know, and but if you try to apply that same tool to lots of other kinds of problems, it will just fail miserably. Okay, so confidence intervals for testing. So, um, so this is kind of like, how do we apply confidence intervals to what we've been doing, right? So um, if we want to do a hypothesis test, but we can, can't simulate under the null, okay, well, so what we can do is this part here. So we can construct 100 minus P percent. So in other words, this is kind of like the complement we talked about before, confidence interval for the population average. And if X is not in the interval, then we reject the null. And if X is in the interval, then we can't reject the null, okay? Um, and so it's kind of like, one of the ways we can kind of invert our problem, okay, so that we can use some of the techniques. Actually, that's another thing to kind of mention, right? So like I was saying, there's we have a bunch of techniques, we have a bunch of different types of problems. We have some sort of constraints about like when you use which technique with which problem, but sometimes what we can do is actually invert the problem or, or modify the problem such that it will fit a particular technique, right? Because maybe we don't have any technique that works with that particular type of problem. So then we have to imagine ways we can change the problem to kind of meet the tech, to fit the technique without compromising the quality of our, you know, work or whatever. Does that make sense? All right, so this is just kind of one of those, those techniques um, where we kind of invert the problem so that uh, we can do the test that we want to. Uh, I don't know if I have a great example of this. Um, it's more like, kind of be aware that just because you're given a problem doesn't mean you have to leave the problem alone to be able to solve it, okay? Um, you probably learned this also in math at some point, right? Like, do you, you know, if you have a, you know, a ratio or whatever, like you can break the problem apart and, and do various techniques so that you can, you know, separate a particular algebraic expression apart so that you can actually figure out what the answer is, which you couldn't do with the problem set up the way it was originally given to you. All right, so center and spread. Um, so I'm trying to think, let me just go back. I thought I had a picture for this, but I guess not. Okay, so center, right? Okay, middle, right? And spread, okay? So those are just kind of terminology we use when we talk about like the center and then how far is the thing spread, okay? And, uh, you know, I'm not sure I have much else to say about that except they're two commonly used terms and that's kind of what they mean. Um, yeah, I should fix that slide because it's not very good. Um, all right, so now we're actually gonna talk about averages um, and Yes, okay. So all of you, I think, know how to calculate an average, right? So um, basically you take all of the parts that you want in the average, okay? You add them up and then you divide the total by the number of things you put into the average, okay? All we're talking about here is that simplest form. This is not even like trying to come up with a grade for a class. We're just talking about the simplest idea of the average. Um, and this is way buildier than it needed to be. Um, so it doesn't need to be a value in the set, right? So we just wanna clarify that because we are talking about percentiles, which have to be, um, it doesn't have to be an integer, even if the data are, um, and somewhere between min and max, but not necessarily halfway in between, right? Um, so sometimes averages get skewed um, and it's, but it is, and one of the things that we're gonna start moving into more in kind of the lectures from here, is when we have different units, okay? So, you know, maybe on one side we have time and another we have metric, right? Or we have metric and we have inches, okay? So we have different units of the various parts of our problem. 
okay? And so we need to be careful of keeping track of what the unit is when we transform it, right? Because we don't always, it doesn't always stick, you know? Um, so you just gotta be careful that the, you know, that you are, you know what the unit is and how you're modifying the unit when you are transforming. In this case, we're just making the point that when you do an average, it doesn't change the units. Um, and it's often used as a smoothing operator. So it'll collect all the contributions in one pot and then split it evenly, you know, for some definitions of even, right? Because a median also splits it evenly, but in kind of a different way. Okay, uh, and so let me just see what's on the next slide. Oh yeah, another super build. I don't know why I'm in these super builds. Um, okay, so just by way of example, um, I think y'all can figure this mostly out, but we can just say sum, and then we can do divided by, oops, len of values. Um, all right, maybe if I run the prior cell first, it'll work better. Right, and then we get an average, yay. Um, and then we have two methods on NP that give us an average. The way we're using them, they're the same. Um, however, you know, what I recommend though is pick one and stick with it. So try to be consistent about it. Um, that way you you will not get, one of the problems you have, this is the uh, programmers often talk about themselves as future me and past me, right? Um, you know, you try not to make too much pain for future me and uh, the memory of past me is terrible. So as clear as I can make it, the better. Um, so one of the reasons that I say to try to stick to it, is you go back and look at it, you know, a week later, two weeks later, and you're like, wait, why did I use average here instead of mean? Like, was I, did I have some reason? Um, so if you try to be consistent, then when you go back and look at it again sometime later, the only time you'll ever see average is because you were trying to do something special and it'll spark something in your brain that you need to figure out what the special was. That makes sense? Um, okay, so just another quick thing is we can have a nice table of values and we can actually get the mean of a column by just running NP mean against the actual column. All right, so annoying build slide now. which I'm gonna jump through um, and, oh yeah, here we go. See, NP average lets you use weights. Um, but so this is just kind of the same as the prior slide, but you'll always get the same answer as long as you don't pass any other parameters here, okay? All right, so medians versus averages, right? Um, so a median and an average will not always give you the same result. All right, so we're just gonna kind of do this one blind, excuse me, and ask, raise your left hand if you think the left one will be bigger, raise your right hand if you think the right one will be bigger and the same if it's both hands. Um, and that should be better written. If you think the mean will be bigger, raise your left hand. If you think the median will be bigger, raise your right hand and raise both hands if you think that they will be the same. All right, ready? Three, two, one, go. All right, fast math, right? Um, all right, so the correct answer is both, or the same, sorry, um, that you will have, you will actually get the same value for these because this outlier over there skews the mean such that it's closer to the median, okay? So um, this is, I don't know if I like this one. I would just do the math, right? I'm not gonna usually try to tell by the picture, but the point kind of is that um, sometimes the picture is not gonna be really clear. And so you might wanna run the calc to, to understand the median versus the mean. Um, and now I was gonna show you how to run the calc um, because we're just going to skip that one. Um, but so I do this with lots of ugly colors here, uh, you know, and, and lots of confusing lines, but I think if you kind of 
eventually figure out what this picture is trying to show, it's pretty useful. Um, so all of the red pieces, okay, are the middle of the histogram box, okay? And so you need that number. And then you also need the count of the histogram box, which is the blue, okay? And then you can multiply the, the middle because what you wanna do is you're gonna say the 11, you know, is gonna average out to be 0.5 because it's the middle of the histogram line or box. Um, you know, and then this one's 1 1.5 times 23, but then you're gonna add those together, okay? And that's how you get kind of your total, okay? Um, and then if you add the, basically all of the lines together, that's how you get your divider or the number of things, okay? So from a histogram, and this probably will be on a test, but from a histogram, you can get to the average by using this trick, right? to get what is the, you know, what is the adding up of the values and then using this trick to get to the, um, what's we call it, to the, to the number of values that you need to divide by to get to the average. That makes sense? Like I said, the, the picture, I think it looks more complicated than it is, but it's like, goes a little overboard on correctness. All right. Yeah. Why is oh um because this picture isn't brilliant, but this line is 0. 0.5. Right. Wait a minute. No, I put it in the wrong place. This line is 0. 0.5. So it's this opening line and 1.5. I should probably put the pinky things. Yeah. I said it wrong. Um, this line is 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5. It's the edges. I knew I was going to throw myself off with putting the little circles in the wrong place. I should make the little circles in the right place. I think it's because in this slide, they don't matter. Um, but so you can also do the same thing with the median, okay? Is that you can now just add up the counts to get uh, 102, right? But to get the median is is easier, right? So you get the total, but then you just divide by two because you just want the middle, right? So that's 51. So then you have to find where 51 is. And the way you do that, it, you know, you can obviously also just look. Um, so 11 plus 23, right? So this column plus this column is 50, is less than 51, right? So it's not there, okay? But 11 plus 23 plus 33 is over 51. So that means it's got to be in this one. Does that make sense? So it tells you it's 51 by just getting the result. And you know where it is by doing that trick then. And so you know it's in the third column. I think this one's super easy on its own. So like, don't overcomplicate it. But this is how you can read the histogram correctly. Does that make sense? I can't believe I made that mistake. This is why I always gotta make sure I look at all my slides before I actually give away. But I was busily writing all the new ones. Make sense? Questions? Thoughts? Like I said, this one, um, I don't know. I just think they're, this has made it much easier for me to understand how they work. All right. So when you compare the median, the median, um, so, uh, the mean is often referred to as the balance point of the histogram. So in other words, like, you know, if you imagined it being a seesaw, okay, where, where do you have to put the little bump that the seesaw is so that it will stay balanced, right? Because that may not be in the middle. If there's a bunch of weight on one side, right? You have heavy person on one side and a light person on the other, then you need to move that little thing that it stands on over towards the heavier person, okay? Um, and the median is always a halfway point. Um, half the area of the histogram or half the data, whichever way you want to read it. But the area, right, is it's literally the area. Half of the area will be on one side and half will be on the other. And then if the distribution is symmetric around a value, then that value is both the average and the median. So in other words, if it's evenly distributed across your histogram, they're going to be the same. If, however, one of them is skewed, it's going to pull it one way or the other. 
So two people on the balance beam or on the seesaw, right? And they their same weight, then the average and the mean will be this, the average and the median will be the same. One's heavier, it'll skew the average, but not the median. Okay. All right, so we're gonna talk quickly about standard deviation. Um, but I'm gonna, well, so maybe I'll run these next time. Um, okay, so, so when we talk about the variability of our distribution, okay, so, like, you know, when you talk about the variability, it's like the biggest value versus the lowest value. But that doesn't actually tell you very much about the distribution. Because, and a lot of the time, what we care about is what does it look like, right? Like as in, you know, is there a heavy person at one end and a light person at the other, right, is important to when we're trying to understand this data. So instead, we can measure the variability around the mean, and we need to figure out a way to quantify this. And... So one of the ways, okay, is to use what's called standard deviation. Um, and so it measures how far the data are from the average. Um, and so the average of the data is the first thing you need. Then you can give, figure out the deviations of data from the mean. Then using kind of the same technique of looking for distance rather than direction, we're going to square those deviations, okay? And then we're going to take the mean of the squares, which we call the variance. So in other words, what is the average of the squares of the distance of, from each one, right? And so we call that the variance. Then we take the square root of the mean and we call that the standard deviation, okay? Um, and there's, we'll, I don't think we're gonna get to it today, but um, we're gonna talk about it. Like I'll show a bunch of examples of this. So, um, but so the thing to kind of remember is like, this is the order. So you take the data, then you get the average, then you look the deviation from the average of every point okay then you square all that then you take the average of that and then you take the square root of that and you end up with a standard deviation okay um and again note that the same deviation has the same units as the data um and this whole thing is often referred to as a root mean square okay um because even though you read it reverse right like a lot of things we're doing right? Root mean square. Okay. So just keep that in mind, um, you know, because you'll start to see RMS in like homework and labs and even the demos that I do. So root mean square, it's just talking about this process. It just kind of talks about it in the reverse direction. Okay. And what I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, um, okay, great. Um, but this is where it gets really interesting, okay? Is that once you can figure out what that standard deviation is, you can actually predict where all of the elements will land to some percentage, okay? Um, and this is called, uh, now I'm not gonna be able to say it. Uh, wait, somebody had it. There you go. Um, I don't know, what, it's one of those words like today, I'm not gonna be able to say it. Shep yeah, can't do it. Um, so we'll just kind of look at this part and we'll come back to it. But what's super cool about it, right, is that you know that if you're within two standard deviations of the center, that 75% of your data will be there. Okay. And like I said, we're, gonna, uh, like we're almost out of time, so we're not going to talk about it today. But um, and then you kind of have these rules that go up so that you can get if you notice, right, it gets closer and closer to the full set, but it's, this is what, what, why outliers are annoying, okay? Um, but if you notice, these numbers are starting to look, this 93.75 and this 96% are getting conveniently useful, right? 